Kwame Nkrumah was one of import substituting industrialization. And in that, he was in line with the policy of many countries at the time, including India and Argentina. Um, and there's a very long history of import substitution industrialization, which actually goes back as far as the British Industrial Revolution. And in the 50s, it was particularly promoted. Am I whistling too much? Uh, I, it was particularly promoted by the Economic Commission on Latin America, led by the Argentine economist Raul Prebisch, who argued that there's a long-term tendency for the terms of trade to move against primary product producers. There's a big controversy as to whether that's true, but certainly that influenced policy, including the policies recommended by the United Nations Economic Commission for Africa when it was founded in 58. However, in a Ghanaian economist, in a Ghanaian context, it's extremely interesting to note that no less an authority than W.A. Lewis who went on to be the first black economist to win the Nobel Prize, and was the author in 1954 of probably the most famous article in development economics. It was called Economic Development with Unlimited Supplies of Labor. And Lewis there envisaged how heavily populated countries in Asia and in his native Caribbean could take advantage of having lots of cheap labor to industrialize. But the year before that article was published, Lewis came to Ghana for a long period uh, as a consultant to the government and wrote a report on industrialization in the Gold Coast. That was the title. But he actually warned the government that Ghana did not have the conditions for successful import substitution industrialization, essentially because labor was too scarce and too expensive. And I think he was right. And I'll come back to that uh, later on when we talk about industrialization in more detail. When um, the government was overthrown in 66, some of the previous foreign admirers of the uh, Kwame Nkrumah regime joined with some members of the CPP to say, well, actually, it was all a mistake. So Fitch and Oppenheimer, who were two American Marxists, brought out a very quick book arguing that Nkrumah's mistake had not been in breaking to some extent with Britain, but in not going far enough in delinking from the world's economy. I'll come back to that illusion. Um, famously, but um, perhaps more famously in Cote d'Ivoire, um, Houphouet Bonny, of course, made a bet with Kwame Nkrumah that Cote d'Ivoire would surpass Ghana in economic terms. And in Houphouet's lifetime, uh, he won the bet. Following the February 66 coup, of course, there was an attempt at economic liberalization. But what strikes me and many other people in retrospect is how limited that liberalization was. The development policy remained very much state-led, uh, based around the cocoa marketing board, even though there was some, there was a little bit of, ro of rowing back on the uh, full extent of state ownership uh, under Kwame Nkrumah. Um, the really radical liberalization was structural adjustment. Um, oh, I, shouldn't, I should dwell a little bit on that heading. From slow growth to rapid decline, I'm afraid this can only be followed by showing one photograph. Um, and he does look, I think you'll agree, remarkably handsome. Um, but unfortunately, in his own words, um, Colonel, later General Champon, declared war on the economy. And despite the fact that Operation Feed Yourself did feed people for about three years as a short-run policy of 
self-sufficiency in foodstuffs in the context of difficulty in covering a balance of payments deficit. It was quite successful. But overall, I have to say, it was under a champon that the economy took its nosedive, began its nosedive, which was then continued under the uh, brief uh, Akufa regime and then um, under the June the 4th revolution through President Le Mans period and then through the first year and a half of uh, the PNDC. Uh, but it did begin the nose dive under a champo. And I think what's absolutely crucial here is that we must recognize that although Ghana was certainly badly hit by the oil shock, it was not unique in that. The same was true of, for example, all other African oil importers. And let me just tell you a brief uh, vignette here. Um, I had taught maths in Kenya in 1975. And in 1978, I paid a trip, I paid a, a revisit to the area where my school was. Now, between 75 and 78, there was a major, if short lived, boom in the world price of beverage crops including cocoa and coffee. Going back to Kenya in 78, I remember a moment where I came over the top of a hill and saw a valley that I used to know like the back of my hand, as they say. But at the, for a moment, I couldn't recognize it. And the reason I couldn't recognize it was because so many farmers had put up new houses or had put roofs on their houses. At the same time, visiting the Volta region in 1977 to study cocoa farming there, as those of you who are as old as me will remember, in uh, the same period, it was a deplorable situation in cocoa villages. Nobody was putting on a new metal roof. Uh, decay abounded. And the, a big question in Ghanaian discussion was, where has the cocoa money gone? And part of it, in fact, never reached Ghana because there is a discrepancy in the, uh, between the cocoa marketing board figures and the figures of the Bank of Ghana that show that a large chunk of it actually was appropriated uh, before it came back. But, uh, and the result of all these policies was a real, very close to a, a real delinking from the world economy with imports and exports at the lowest level that they've been probably since the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, unlike in Fitch and Oppenheimer's uh, dream, it was a very painful experience. The, policy, the single policy that I would pick out as most destructive was the hugely overvalued, more or less non-convertible currency. Um, the uh, Ghana had quite understandably, and I think rightly, gone for monetary independence from Britain uh, in 64-65. Uh, the question, once you've gone for that, is are you prepared to be valid if you need to? Kenya did several times, but Ghana was extremely reluctant to, so Bouzi eventually did it, uh, probably too late, uh, providing the occasion for a champong's coup. But the very slight over, over valuations of the late early 70s uh, are as nothing compared to what happened in the late 70s, early 80s. So by the beginning of the 80s, this is the situation that faced cocoa farmers. Remember, the major producers of Ghanaian wealth at that time. For each $100 earned by Ghanaian cocoa on the world market, the marketing board would probably take about 50 in a perfectly normal, effective uh, tax, also covering its rather inflated marketing costs. That was more or less the same as neighboring Cote d'Ivoire. The difference was that in Cote d'Ivoire, 
the 50% the farmers got was paid in convertible currency. In, the, in Ghana, more or less 45 of, out of that 50 was in principle swallowed up by the Bank of Ghana because the currency was overvalued so many times that the real purchasing power of $100 worth of cocoa internationally by the time it came to the cocoa farmer was only five or six dollars. Not surprisingly, nobody was planting cocoa, except strangely enough, the World Bank. Um, but that's, let's, let me leave aside that minor uh, point. Um, a question that arises for any historian is how did cocoa farmers, especially in Ghana, come to allow themselves to be so heavily exploited? Um, because in fact, there was a long tradition of resistance by small producers producing for export or for the market more generally to excessive taxation or to uh, exploitation by firms. So there, as uh, some of you will have recognized, Asantehini Mensabonsu, who was overthrown in 1883 at the, or just before the Asante Civil War, and according to the stool records of Asante Bakwai, the revolt against him began in the gold pits, began by commoners, not chiefs. And it was a protest, essentially a rebellion against excessive taxation. Then in the colonial period, you have this series of cocoa holdups where farmers united to force the dissolution of successive cartels established by European cocoa buying companies. So the question then is what went wrong from the farmer's point of view? Why were they so politically weak to be unable to assert themselves against such a penal level of taxation? There's a very good uh, book in 1976 by Beckman um, arguing that essentially Kwame Nkrumah demobilized the cocoa farmers politically by absorbing them or their organizations into the CPP. What made that possible, I think, was the conflict that preceded independence, the party conflict between the CPP on the one hand and the National Liberation Movement on the other. The, why that was fatal was that the cocoa farming movement split uh, and the cocoa farmers union in Ashanti supported the unsuccessful NLM and the uh, branch in the colony, as it was called, supported the CPP. And since then, you have not had an effective uh, representation from below of co from cocoa farmers, unless, of course, in recent years, we, we talk about cooperatives. So what about the recovery? The first thing to say is, why did it happen? Um, Sorry, the, uh, the words are so small, I should have enlarged them. For historians, when we try and explain something important, there's a tendency to think in terms either of structure or contingency, that either the set of circumstances and an underlying pattern of behavior was such that something might perhaps be more or less inevitable, or on the other hand, that there's a strong element of chance and individuals making a difference. And I would uh, emphasize that it seems to me it's only in retrospect that the U-turn that the PNDC undertook, I mean, remember they had come to power not only to try and establish some form of popular democracy based upon workers' and people's defense committees, but also, just as with the June the 4th revolution, to make the price control regime inherited from a Champong and a Kufo and Liman work. They came to power determined to, in a sense, continue in the pattern that was epitomized by the blowing up of Makola market in 1979. So to move from enforcing price controls, however far they were from market reality, to hand, 
handing over mechanisms to, to the market, handing over resource allocation to the market. That was truly a U-turn. And coming to terms with the IMF and the World Bank in the process was even the lesser part of that U-turn. And it seems to me this it's only looks inevitable in retrospect. At the time, those of us who remember it, I don't think it was at all obvious. Uh, do you remember the phrase ARA? After Rawlings, a catapori. Um, also, there was no pressure from the farmers in an organized way. There were no cocoa farmers unions saying we'll go on, we'll stop growing cocoa. There was really no pressure from the rural areas, it seems to me, except no organized pressure, that is. But what you certainly had was fiscal collapse um, brought about by the partial uh, boycott of official markets, not only by cocoa farmers in the sense of smuggling cocoa to neighboring countries, but equally or more so by market traders and others. And when people were tr not trading in official markets, of course, they were evading tax. So there, I think one can speak of a kind of spontaneous, unorganized uh, fiscal revolt that contributed, to, that, that reinforced the effect of the declining GDP in bringing about a situation where the government's income had become incredibly low. Its share of income was barely a third uh, in 1983 of what it had been in 74. And that is that from a much reduced GDP. So it seems to me that was at least the context um, that structured the decision-making process. Um, of course, many other things played a part. And I do think uh, there was a role for contingency and things could have been different. OK, once structural adjustment had been embarked upon, um, the most interesting features long term, and of course I've got to be very brief, it seems to me are the third cocoa boom of Ghanaian history from the late 90s, early 2000s, accompanied throughout the process, throughout this period, by accelerated industrial, accelerated urbanization. So between 84 and 2000, uh, there was a 50% increase in the proportion of the population living in towns. Um, again, you get this massive reinvestment in cocoa farming. Once the farmer's share of the world price had been greatly increased in the 80s, and especially when the world price itself uh, expanded rapidly in the 90s, late 90s. So, as you know, output reached in one year over a million, nearly double the previous record set in 1964-65. Um, and it's worth noting that this third cocoa boom also involved, to some extent, new technology in that, as you know, high yielding varieties and fertilizers for the first time played a big part. It wasn't just bringing more land under cultivation. So finally, while I try to avoid falling off the uh, lectern, finally, um, what about the search for this elusive industrialization sought by Kwame Nkrumah? And by the way, not only by the leadership, this was a genuinely, extremely popular ambition. Back in 1948, uh, following the riots that took place uh, in that year, the British government in London set up the Watson Commission to report on the causes of the riots. And the Watson Commission report says that on every side we heard the cry of industrialization. So already back in 48, um, Ghanaians and this clearly meant uh, civil society and also uh, presumably beyond that, favored industrialization. Yet as we've seen so far, not much to show for it. 
at the time of independence, at least the nearest figure I could get for a comparative table was 1960. Here's 1960, manufacturing as a share of gross domestic product in a number of African countries. The ones in bold are the ones with the highest share of manufacturing. And if anybody is interested, I can uh, try to explain why it was those. Ghana is more or less in mid-table, 6.3%. Um, so although Ghana was doing very well in exporting cocoa, um, the manufacturing side was not particularly impressive, even by 57, when, by the way, it was well up on what it had been 10 years before. Now, a fundamental reason for this, it seems to me, and here I go back to W.A. Lewis's advice to Kwame Nkrumah, uh, advice which I think is vindicated by research on real wages in different parts of colonial Africa and also colonial Asia. Unfortunately, this research does not so far include South Korea. Um, but uh, this is real wages calculated in the best way that economic historians know how, which is where you express the wage as a multiple of the amount of money you need to keep alive four people, two adults and two children. I know that particular family ratio makes no sense in this context, but in fact the mess works out the same. Um, and here you have figures from Frank Hamer and Van Weijenberg, two Dutch uh, economic historians, for the four decades in which there was not a world war to distort the figures. And it, this is for capitals of British colonies, because that's where they had the data. And you'll see that West Africa, in the shape of Lagos and Accra, um, does much better than East Africa. Now, it's well known, among economic historians anyway, that real wages um, were higher in non-secular economies than they were for the black population in South Africa or Southern Rhodesia, now Zimbabwe. But this is a comparison largely among non-secular economies. So why are the wages in West Africa so much higher than in Kampala, for example, or in Dar es Salaam, two countries of which there were no settlers. The answer, I think, in one word, is cocoa. I can give a slightly more subtle version of it. But basically, in Uganda, they were mainly at that time growing cotton, which was not nearly as lucrative as cocoa. So Teti Kwashi deserved his circle. And I'm very sorry that that circle has been greatly compromised by recent constructions. Um, that adoption of cocoa farming, let me just uh, remind you, somebody who uh, studies cocoa farming, was a remarkably innovative act. Apart from Teddy Kwashi himself, nobody, none of the original adopters of cocoa had ever seen a mature cocoa tree at the time they started planting it. It was an incredibly risky thing to do. It involved new techniques because it was an annual crop and it was the best thing they could do economically in the circumstances available. And there the competition of cocoa farmers for northern, especially northern labour is the basic reason I think why urban wages too, as in this figure, had to be high. If you wanted to hire uh, laborers in Accra in the 1950s, you had to compete with the cocoa farmers. Here's the bad news. That also meant, as Lewis pointed out in 1953, that Ghana was not likely to be very competitive with cheap labor economies, because the labor was actually, though Ghana was a poor country, real wages were actually higher than in a lot of other comparable countries, even in, in Asia. Um, just to show the growth of urbanization, which I think is relevant because urbanization tends to be associated, even if it doesn't lead to industrialization, it does tend to be associated with a diversification of occupations. 
and greater opportunities to do more things than um, is possible in a predominantly agricultural economy. So I am reasonably optimistic about the fact that Ghana ha now has a majority urban population. Um, but if we look at the occupational structure according to the 2010 census, among the economically active population, um, this figure only includes those over 15, and as we know, there's some who are below 15 who are also economically active, but let, let us uh, let that pass. Agriculture remained by far the biggest occupation, and manufacturing is roughly, is, is round about 10%. By the way, that manufacturing also appears not to be very efficient, considering that manufacturing share of output in the same year was only about 7%, and yet 10% of the uh, workforce was engaged in it. So, here I come to my uh, policy suggestion, which um, I'm, uh, which is really a focus on labor-intensive industrialization. Let me begin with an observation from the economic history of other continents, that historically, labor-intensive industrialization has been the main route by which industrialization has spread from the West to various parts of Asia, starting with late 19th century Japan, and even including the beginnings of industrialization in South Korea, and the beginnings of industrialization in China. I say the beginnings because, of course, once the process of industrialization is underway, then you get an accumulation of capital enabling the economy to go into other kinds of industry. You know, today, Japan, of course, is a world leader in robotics. So, you know, the days of labor intensity in Japan are, are, are over. But as the way it began, labor intensive industrialization has been the main route up to now. And this is noted by the trade economist Robert Baldwin. Um, in a book called The Great Convergence, which is extremely optimistic about the prospects of African industrialization following in this path. So what do I mean by labor-intensive industrialization? Um, you might think, well, it's almost a contradiction in terms, because the whole idea of industrialization is that you have more machines, isn't it? So you increase the ratio of capital to labor. Yes, indeed, that is exactly what industrialization involves. But within that, the term labor-intensive industrialization can mean two things. First, it means that you start with those industries or those phases of production within a specific industry, which is a much more 21st century pattern those phases of production or those industries which wherever, they're, wherever they are undertaken tend to be undertaken in a comparatively labor intensive way. That's to say labor cost is a significant part of the total costs. And historically textiles have been the number one example of that. Uh, something that of course has not been very successful in Ghana, um, uh, handling weaving aside. Um, the, other for, the other kind of labor-intensive industrialization, which is entirely consistent with the former, is where you have a product that can be produced in more and less labor-intensive ways. And there you see in Japan in the late 19th century, for example, um, and also examples in, uh, in various other countries, a conscious choice of technique in favor of the more labor-intensive way simply because they had cheap labor, whereas capital was very expensive to them at that stage. Very importantly, this must not be confused with excessive hiring of labor. And one of the things that actually handicapped gone in industry in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, even into the 80s, was probably excessive recruitment um, in that there was also a political imperative to provide jobs, perhaps for party supporters, and to absorb or prevent unemployment. And unfortunately, that is no part of 
successful labor-intensive industrialization, uh, which is just as lean and ruthless as capital-intensive industrialization. I think there are good reasons today to be relatively optimistic about the prospects for Ghanaian industrialization of this kind, despite the low level of Ghanaian industry as a share of GDP at the moment. The fundamental reason is that the conditions that Lewis described no longer pertain. The population has grown by four times since 1957. And in, although real wages are higher than they were in 57, in international terms, of course, they're much lower compared to the competition. Chinese wages are now higher than Ghanaian wages. Again, in 1957, although Ghana had a relatively, had quite, had a relatively high amount of education compared to other colonies, the level was far less than today. So today, you have what in international terms is a relatively cheap labor force and a much more educated one than before. So it seems to me that Ghana is now in the position where the gap between the present situation in terms of factor resources, resources of labor and capital, and where Ghana would need to be to have a comparative advantage in manufacturing. That gap, which was very wide in 57, I think much wider than the case of South Korea and other densely populated uh, East Asian countries at the time, that gap is now much less than it was. And that, in turn, is one of the reasons, I think, why, interestingly enough, some very senior World Bank economists have begun to say, after all, Africa needs industrial policy. You know, at the time of structural adjustment, the message from the bank was simply, do what you're already doing best at. Just stick to cocoa is the best thing. It's the thing you've got a comparative advantage in. And so it, it's really interesting that you have Joseph Stiglitz, former chief economist, Nobel Prize winner, um, and also uh, Justin Lin, a very recent chief economist at the World Bank, plus two other senior World Bank economists, including Celestine Monga, probably the most senior African economist at the World Bank. I think actually he's just left the bank. They published a paper last year advocating the revival of industrial policy in African countries generally, and saying that Africa needs to take advantage of the urban uh, population, and even to encourage further rural-urban drift, in order to make uh, African countries competitive in the world market for manufacturers. Now, the fact that they're distinguished economists doesn't mean they're right, um, but it is a very interesting change. Of course, favorable factor endowments are not enough. The right sort of state intervention is critical, as we certainly saw in South Korea. And there are different ways in which states can be developmental. A market economist would tell you that the crucial thing a state can do is to enforce property rights, especially private property rights. And in that context, uh, it does seem to me that the um, system of land tenure, which served God very well during cocoa expansions, um, may now need review. But I'll expand on that if there's time, if anybody wants me to. What can be said, I think, is very clearly laissez-faire by itself has very rarely led to industrialization. I'm tempted to say never, but I suppose you could make a case for Hong Kong and maybe Singapore, but I would say that was it. Um, all larger countries that industrialized actually at some point had some form of state intervention. Doesn't mean it's the state owning lots of factories, but you know, the US industrialized behind tariff barriers. A problem today I mean, it has an upside, but it is also an inconvenience. The World Trade Organization restricts the possibilities for protectionism. That actually may even be a blessing in disguise for Ghana, because uh, it is very important to aim at the world market, not simply at the far too small 
domestic market. And the, the World Trade Organization rules do allow a certain degree of leeway. So it's, it is feasible to aim to provide a certain degree of protection and also to aim at export markets. Late development, meaning industrialization in a world where others have already industrialization, basically requires some sort of state intervention. Um, the exact form vary. However, this doesn't mean a recipe for having a bloated state, and I do think the state of the 60s and the state of the 70s, at least in aspiration, was quite bloated. You know, when you had a situation when more people were apparently working for the cocoa marketing board than were actually farming cocoa, you know, um, and that admittedly did include some people who were dead, but were, whose salaries were still being drawn. Um, I, I don't accept the view that was axiomatic in the uh, neoliberal uh, e economics of the uh, 1980s and 90s that any form of state intervention is essentially rent-seeking, um, grabbing surpluses produced by imperfect competition. But the literature on rent-seeking does make some very important points and does have serious warnings that uh, any form of state-led industrialization can only work if the state is very disciplined, including within itself, and keeps corruption uh, very much under control. Um, otherwise, apart from the political consequences, it's a major diversion of scarce resources. Um, so I think there is a case for a selectively interventionist, but still relatively slim and economy-minded state. Uh, uh, just a quick comment on um, one policy. Um, I think that is perhaps overdoing it a bit, uh, in the sense that as an economic historian, I have to say that where countries have industrialized up to now, it's never been the whole country industrializing at once. Um, large parts of Britain, Germany, the United States, uh, China, when they industrialized, one did not have a factory in every district. A factory in every region might work, but a factory in every district, I think, is probably pushing it into areas where they would only lose money. And an efficient state policy of industrialization can't afford waste. There also needs to be an accompanying agricultural revolution. But I think my time is more or less up, so I will actually just pass through that very quickly. Um, there has been a big change since the 50s, which essentially means there isn't the land available to increase output by bringing more land under cultivation. It has to be through agricultural intensification, which is extremely difficult with the soil quality and the need to find an alternative to fallowing to, re in, to restore that fertility. Um, the recent cocoa revolution, or cocoa takeoff, actually was achieved to some extent using more intensive technology. So that's a kind of encouraging example. Finally, I ought to mention two threats that I have not touched upon. One is environmental degradation both on the ground, and I particularly think of the adverse consequences of uncontrolled galamse. And also in the air, something Ghana by itself can do nothing about, but climate change uh, does mean an even drier Africa in future, which is not helpful for agriculture or public health. Um, and there's also the point that African countries need to be careful that when, if there is, if it is indeed when, the world sees sense and takes the decision to keep some of the fossil fuels in the ground, that the fossil fuels that are kept in the ground are those in rich countries, such as in the North Sea or in Alaska, rather than the fossil fuels off the coast of West Africa. And the other threat is robots. We don't know how this will play out. Every round of mechanization uh, since the Industrial Revolution has been accompanied by predictions that there'll be mass unemployment, 
so far those predictions have always been partly right, but in the end mainly wrong. And we have to hope that the same is true with the latest round. Um, but undoubtedly, there is a risk that robots may uh, displace cheap labor. Uh, but at the moment, we, we simply don't know how that will really work out. And as far as I can see, labor-intensive industrialization currently remains the, the most likely route to industrialization. Certainly, it's not trying to go direct to robots. Um, so, to summarize, the record since 57 has really turned around, revolved around what changed in 83. Excessive state intervention trying to dictate prices and quantities throughout the economy proved a catastrophe by 83. Um, the recovery since then ha actually has been very impressive. and. Um, on the other hand, it hasn't, of course, led to industrialization. So I ended by um, suggesting a focus not only on industrialization in general, but particularly on labor-intensive industrialization. Thank you very much.